So you can see how this works out in the case of individuals. I just want to, one could, you don't even have to remember all these, but just as an indication of where these people are coming from or who they are. Um, as I said, that, let's, going from the top down, the two African-American senators in this period. Um, Hiram Revels had been born free in North Carolina. He had been educated there in a school for black children, a private thing in North Carolina. Then he studied at a seminary. He, he was religious, wanted to become a minister in Ohio. He became a missionary for the African Methodist Episcopal Church. Uh, he came south as a chaplain with the Union Army. So, um, because black regiments had chaplains like anybody else, and they were tended to be black uh, religious figures. So, Revels represents, as I say, he's free, he's educated, he's religious, and he's been in the army. He's got those four qualities all together. Um, and he was elected to the Senate for a, sh a short term of about a year uh, in 18. Uh, 70. Uh, they went, they, they sort of try to go back to the original term. So he actually was, was filling the seat that had been occupied by Jefferson Davis. But that seat had been unoccupied, for, but it's the term was still there. So there's only one year left in the term, and they elected Revels to serve as the first African American in Congress to serve out um, their, that term. The other African American senator was a guy named Blanche K. Bruce who had been born a slave in Virginia, but had been, uh, was a sort of privileged slave. He was the son of his, of his owner and a slave woman. The owner had edu provided for his education, but he was a slave until the Civil War when he ran away uh, and began uh, eventually organizing black schools. He studied for a while at Oberlin College in Ohio, one of the very few to admit black students at that time came to Mississippi in 1868, actually bought a plantation, became pretty wealthy, and was elected to the Senate in 1875, I think. Now when the traditional, uh, the, the, the tradition in the Senate is that when a new senator takes a seat, the, sen the other senator from that state presents him or her to the Senate. So when Gillibrand was named to the Senate, by Governor Patterson, uh, Schumer, our other senator, presented her to the Senate. Here's our, but, but James Alcorn, who we'll talk about in a minute, who was the, the other senator from Mississippi, refused to present uh, Bruce because he was black. So Bruce is walking up to take the oath of office and nobody is there. So Senator Roscoe Conkling of New York jumps up and walks down the aisle with Bruce to present him to the Senate rather than his colleague from Mississippi. I only mention that because later, Bruce's son, Roscoe Bruce, became a major black political leader in, um, in, uh, in Washington, D.C., I think, uh, in the early 20th century. Roscoe Bruce. He's named Roscoe because Roscoe Conkling, the senator from New York, had presented Bruce, his father, to the, to the Senate. So, um, even within the Republican Party, Alcorn is sort of a Republican at that time. There's still, you know, a lot of tension. Let me mention a few others, uh, some of them close to my heart in one way or another. Jonathan Wright, Jonathan J. Wright. He was a black uh, lawyer uh, f trained in law from Pennsylvania who came to South Carolina with the Freedmen's Bureau and became the only African American and the first in our history to be appointed to the state Supreme Court in South Carolina, Jonathan J. Wright, the first African-American member of a state Supreme Court. So, in 1998, I was sitting in my office over here, and I got a phone call saying, um, will, you, will you take a call from the chief judge of the South Carolina Supreme Court? I said, the, Supreme, the head of the Supreme Court of South Carolina is calling? I said, I should have paid that parking ticket when I was down there. <laughs> They are pretty tough. I said, of course. So I take, I said, well, he says, well, I'm, I want to introduce myself. I'm the chief judge, and I am also African-American. I'm the first African-American chief justice of South Carolina. I said, well, congratulations. You know, what can I do for you? He said, well, have you ever been in the Supreme Court building in Columbia? I said, yeah, I have been in there. It's an imposing place. 
And he said, have you seen all the portraits? They have on the walls the portrait of every person who ever sat on the Supreme Court of South Carolina, with one exception. He said, you know, there's one portrait missing. I said, yeah, of course, Jonathan J. Wright. They're not putting him up there. He said, well, I got a portrait commissioned. I commissioned a portrait, and I'm going to have it unveiled, and I want you to come down and give a lecture on Jonathan J. Wright and his contributions to Reconstruction. So I said, well, I'd be delighted to do that, but who's going to come to such a lecture? He said, I'm the Chief Justice. I'm going to recommend that every lawyer in the state who practices before the bar of the Supreme Court of South Carolina had better come and hear this lecture. So I did. I went down. I gave a lecture. There were a lot of lawyers present. They filled up the uh, Supreme Court chambers, and I talked about Jonathan J. Wright. It was very good. And then the, um, the next day, the local newspaper, the state, had an editorial about this, which at the very end, it, it's great, because at the very end it says, it talks about Jonathan J. Wright. It says, it's about time it, that it is, there was a discussion of a time in our history, our history, that, that like Justice Wright has for too long been vilified. So that I thought was progress. South Carolina is saying it's, Reconstruction has been too long been vilified down there. And little progress has been made. This is from Alabama. Just a couple of years ago, Alabama legislature has passed a resolution honoring black lawmakers who served in the Reconstruction era. Okay. That doesn't prove that much, but it's good. In other words, Reconstruction is coming to be seen as part of Southern history. That's all. That's what it was. It wasn't this bizarre aberration, this weird moment that just can be wiped off the slate of history. Um, so they're, they're making progress. Um, who else? Uh, let me just give you a couple of others to show you. Uh, Francis Cardozo, another son of a white slave owner and a slave woman. He was from South Carolina. He had a divinity degree from the University of Glasgow. And he came back and served as superintendent of education in South Carolina uh, during Reconstruction. Uh, another key guy in South Carolina was um, Robert Elliott. It's a little vague. Some, some people think he was English or he may have served in the British Navy. Some people think he was born in Massachusetts, but whatever. He was free before the Civil War. He came to South Carolina. This is a very widely circulated broadside, the shackle broken by the genius of freedom. And the centerpiece, which is actually the cover of my book, I didn't realize, is Eliot speaking in the House of Representatives in 1874 on the Civil Rights Bill of that year, which we will talk about. But all these scenes, black soldiers are on there, uh, black navy, Charles Sumner, et cetera. And in the, at the bottom, the free, a black family in their little house with working the fields, the ide <laughs> idealization of freedom. And that's Eliot. And one other South Carolina, very important South Carolina um, uh, figure, Robert Smalls. He was a member of Congress, but much more. He was in the state legislature, state constitutional convention. Anyone heard of Robert Smalls? He became very prominent in the Civil War. Anyone know why? What did Robert Smalls do? Yeah, exactly. He, he was a pilot. He was actually a pilot on a boat that operated in Charleston Harbor. And one night in, I think, 1862, he got his family and some other slaves on board. He disguised himself as the captain. He sailed the boat out of Charleston Harbor. Uh, he knew there was some kind of signal or something you had to give, and he gave it. And he surrendered the boat to the Union Navy. And this, he made him a big hero in the North, and he eventually got a commission in the Union Navy. And um, after the war, he came to Beaufort, South Carolina, and set up a major base of black political power there in the Sea Islands, where long after Reconstruction, he was in Congress in the 1880s. He served in the South Carolina Constitutional Convention of 1895. He held the office of Collector of Customs at um, Beaufort down until 1913. 50 years after emancipation. So he was a very, and of course, why did he lose it in 1913? It was because Woodrow Wilson came in, the first Southern-born president since the Civil War, who evicted all blacks from federal patronage positions and segregated Washington, D.C., which had not been segregated until that point. So Smalls lost his job along with a lot of other people. Um, one could go on with many other 
uh, individuals here. Uh, Georgia has uh, some interesting guys. One is Tunis Campbell, who was actually a free man. He worked in hotels and restaurants. In fact, before the war in New York, Tunis Campbell published what was apparently a fairly widely read little book called The Hotel Keeper's Guide. It was about how to run a hotel, you know? And um, he, he, he was a kind of waiter, head waiter, hotelier. He came south with the Union Army and um, became a major political leader, again, in the Georgia uh, Sea Islands. Um, there, were, there were others in, 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 in Florida. Uh, we have these two brothers from Pennsylvania. Mifflin Gibbs here became a major leader in Arkansas. In fact, Mifflin Gibbs had gone to Canada before the war and served in public office in Vancouver before coming to the US. So in Canada, they were a little more advanced than we were in that. Um, and then he came to Arkansas, and then his brother, Jonathan Gibbs here, was a graduate of Dartmouth, one of the very, very few African Americans to have a degree, a college degree other than Oberlin before the war, and he became a commissioner uh, of education in, uh, in Florida.